Reading a SKU-T chart is actually a pretty easy task and is fundamental for storm chasers. The SKU-T chart as shown here is a basic chart set up to show a more complete look at the atmosphere as a whole. Running diagonally to the left are isotherms or areas of equal temperature, while running curved and diagonally to the left are dry adiabats, which show the rate of change of temperature in an air parcel of dry air rising or descending adiabatically. The numbers on the left side show atmospheric heights or areas of equal pressure and are associated with other forecast products we will eventually discuss in this series. The green line in the chart shows the air dew point. The red line shows temperature with height. The wind barbs on the right side of the main box show the wind at a particular height. We will study all of these lines and what they mean later in this series. Due to its molten iron core, the Earth has a magnetic field around it, just like a bar magnet. This magnetic field extends outwards into space, forming a big bubble that we call the magnetosphere. The inner layer of the magnetosphere, from near the Earth's surface up to a thousand or so kilometers, is called the ionosphere because it is made up of particles ionized by radiation from the Sun. In low-frequency radio astronomy, when we point our telescopes to the sky to measure the faint signals that travel through space to reach us, we need to take structures and perturbations in the ionosphere into account that might change these signals. We need a good understanding of the effects of the ionosphere to make sense of our data. Pictured near the surface, the Earth's magnetic field lines run parallel and come out at an angle to the ground. It has long been postulated that tubular plasma structures go along the magnetic field lines, and it is structures like these that can affect our astronomical measurements. Previously, people could only guess what they might look like, since no one has ever been able to image them. So here you can see a gigantic thundercloud that's lit up by what we would call traditional lightning. So here we have these red sprites. So this is red lightning that's shooting upwards out towards space uh, at the same time that there's traditional white lightning that we know. And as I looked further, I also saw this. So here we have one of these blue jets, so blue lightning again shooting up into space. And I actually managed to capture that on film so in about four seconds right here, you'll see this blue lightning. There we go. According to the researchers, this is the first time they've ever seen this, this blue lightning shoot up like that. So they are very, very excited about it and have already started to, to analyze the data to try to get a better understanding. It bodes very well for the future when, when ASIM will be up there in the next couple of years. And hopefully ASIM will help us to understand this much, much better.
Three ground-based networks are currently available in AWIPS, including the National Lightning Detection Network, or NLDN, Earth Networks, or ENTLN, and the Regionally Limited Lightning Mapping Array, or LMA. Observations from these networks will differ from the upcoming Space-Based Geostationary Lightning Mapper, or GLM. It is important to be aware of the unique strengths and limitations of these networks. The National Lightning Detection Network is likely the most well-known, covering the continental United States and the nearshore waters with greater than 95% detection efficiency of clouded ground flashes within 200 kilometers of CONUS. The NLDN updates every minute and has an average location accuracy of approximately 200 meters. Within AWIPS, the NLDN shows the point locations of clouded ground flashes, which can also be selected as a density product, and whether or not the clouded ground flash was positively or negatively charged. The NLDN may receive some AWIPS updates in the near future. These updates could include plotting each return stroke of a flash. Also, the NLDN observes some fraction of intracloud flashes, but these data are not presently available in AWIPS. The Earth Network's Total Lightning Network became available in AWIPS during 2014. The ENTLN detects some fraction of cloud ground lightning globally because it includes observations from the Worldwide Lightning Location Network. The best ENTLN coverage is over the continental United States and nearshore waters, where the network detects greater than 90% of cloud ground flashes and greater than 50% of intracloud flashes. The ENTLN has a one minute temporal update and approximately 500 meter location accuracy. Within AWIPS, the ENTLN displays both cloud to ground and intracloud flashes. Uneven sensor distribution results in some detection efficiency variability across the network. AWIPS currently provides three basic display features. First is the point location of the cloud to ground and intracloud flashes, which can be selected as a density. Second is the polarity of the cloud to ground flashes. Lastly, the raw pulses or lightning flash components can be plotted to add spatial extent. The lightning mapping arrays have been available to some National Weather Service offices. LMA networks typically have a range of 250 kilometers from their center. The LMA networks provide detailed three-dimensional mapping of intracloud lightning channels and the intracloud components of cloud ground flashes. LMAs observe tens to thousands of geolocated emission sources per lightning flash. The detection efficiency is in the upper 90% for all lightning at the network's core and then degrades with range. Operationally, the lightning mapping arrays update every one to two minutes with a location accuracy of tens of meters that degrades with range from the center of the network. Within AWIPS, the raw sources or components of a flash are shown as a density product revealing the full spatial extent. The sources can be combined into flashes which better relate to the updraft intensity and viewed as a flash extent density. A pseudo geostationary lightning mapper demonstration product has also been created but will become obsolete once the geostationary lightning mapper is operational. The geostationary lightning mapper will be the newest lightning observation system and is set to launch on the GOES-R series satellites. Geostationary lightning mapper covers most of the GOES field of view from 55 degrees south to 55 degrees north. The GLM will observe both cloud to ground and intracloud lightning. The spatially uniform detection efficiency exceeds 70% during the day and 90% at night for all lightning. GLM lightning observations will be available in AWIPS within 20 seconds after the lightning occurs. The GLM observations will be reported on a grid with a spatial resolution ranging from 8 kilometers at nadir to 14 kilometers at the edge. Within AWIPS, the GLM will not differentiate between cloud to ground and intracloud flashes. Rather, AWIPS will display the locations of lightning events, pixels illuminated during a two microsecond interval, groups analogous to return strokes, and flashes. Additional GLM visualizations beyond these initial capabilities are under development. Dark Lightning, presented by Science at NASA. NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope was launched in 2008 on a mission to study high energy phenomena in our universe. The telescope routinely detects things like flares, powered by black holes in distant galaxies, or outbursts from massive stars going supernova. So, in 2010, researchers were not surprised when the telescope was hit by a beam of high-energy positrons, the antimatter equivalent of electrons. That's the sort of thing Fermi is out there looking for. But they were surprised when they realized where the antimatter came from, not from some black hole light years across the galaxy, but rather from our own planet. The source was a thunderstorm just 3,000 miles away. 
Earth's magnetic field seems to have corralled about 100 trillion positrons from the storm into a tight beam and funneled them all the way to the spacecraft, explains lightning expert Joseph Dwyer of the Florida Institute of Technology. Something was producing antimatter above the clouds of Earth and hurling it into space at nearly the speed of light. But what? Dwyer and collaborators at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center and the University of Alabama believe they have figured it out. The answer, says Dwyer, is dark lightning. Dark lightning may sound like an oxymoron, but there is growing evidence that it is real. Ordinary lightning happens when electric fields build up inside thunderclouds. Electrons rush from one part of the cloud to another to try to cancel out the growing voltage. The flash of light we see traces the path of the charged particles, which heat the air five times hotter than the sun. If Dwyer's ideas are correct, dark lightning is a competitor of ordinary lightning. It also tries to cancel out the thunderstorm's electric fields. The process, he says, goes something like this. Under the right conditions, electric fields in a thunderstorm can create a powerful avalanche of electrons, shooting upwards nearly as fast as light. The electrons collide with air molecules, in turn producing gamma rays. Earth-orbiting spacecraft have been observing gamma ray flashes from thunderstorms since at least the mid-1990s. Next, the gamma ray energy transforms into a pair of particles, an electron and a positron. Successive collisions between these particles and other air molecules create a new batch of positrons and electrons, and the cycle repeats. A continuous feedback loop forms, like nuclear fission. It's a natural, self-generated, self-sustained particle accelerator, says Dwyer. Once the feedback loop gets started, he says, it can discharge parts of a thundercloud as fast as lightning. And, because the cascading electrons and positrons generate more gamma rays than visible light, the whole process is practically invisible to the human eye. Researchers once thought that gamma ray flashes from thunderstorms were a weird byproduct of ordinary lightning. Now they are thinking it is a sign of dark lightning instead. The gamma ray burst monitor on board Fermi is excellent at catching these flashes. At the American Geophysical Union meeting last month, Valerie Connaughton of the University of Alabama in Huntsville explained how new data processing techniques have improved the burst monitor's performance even more. In mid-2010, we began testing a mode which allows us to locate many faint gamma-ray flashes we had been missing, she said. Now, team members estimate, Fermi should be able to catch almost 1,000 flashes a year. With data like that, Researchers hope to shed new light on dark lightning and solve its mysteries once and for all. For more news about dark and mysterious things in the skies of Earth, visit science.nasa.gov. Scientists had a problem. It turns out that if you calculate the energy stored in the solar wind, you find that it's not large enough to generate the spectacular light show called the aurora borealis. There had to be another source of energy driving the auroras. That source of energy comes from the Earth's magnetic field. 
It deflects the solar wind, making the charged particles blow around the planet. On the Earth's dark side, energy from the solar wind gets stored up and then released in bursts by the planet's magnetic field lines. These lines cross on the dark side of the Earth, and when these lines cross, they rearrange themselves, releasing a burst of energy. And that's the energy of what are called substorms. The magnetic substorms create lots of turbulence, which generates the rotating motion any tornado needs. That rotation comes from circular whirling eddies, similar to the rings of swirling vapor that show up in the turbulent flow of a wind tunnel on Earth. And these eddies are the space tornadoes themselves. And about a minute later after these eddies form, that eddy, that twisting of the magnetic field line, funnels down into Earth's ionosphere, where it is ultimately responsible for the aurora. The space tornadoes generating Earth's auroras are huge. They form more than 62,000 miles above the planet's surface, taking on a classic funnel cloud shape. Wide at the top, but narrow at the bottom, where they touch the Earth's atmosphere. Space tornadoes out in Earth's magnetosphere are twice the size of the Earth, about 15,000 miles in diameter. But when they touch down on the Earth, they're actually quite narrow. So you've got this flowing, swirling set of particles that looks a lot like a tornado. But tornadoes in this near-Earth space and their even bigger cousins on the sun seem tiny compared to the twisters in the deep regions of the universe. Imagine the power of galaxy-sized tornadoes stretching across space for a million light years or more. To get a tornado in space, you need something to be set in motion analogous to the wind, and you need some mechanism that makes them go around and spiral around, forming that funnel shape we're familiar with, with tornadoes. So we're looking at the role of thunderstorms and electrified clouds in the global electric circuit. So a cloud doesn't have to actually be producing lightning to be electrified. And there's what we call a Wilson current that generally runs from the top of the cloud into the ionosphere and helps feed the global electric circuit. So in, a, in the typical thunderstorm setup, it's a source of charge. In the reverse setup, or the um, opposite polarity, it's generally a sink. So we're hoping to find some parameters of thunderstorms, like we're looking at the speed of the updraft and how much ice is in there, and we're hoping we can relate that to 
how strong or weak the current is. Yeah, so uh, I'm from Penn State University and Communications and Space Science uh, Laboratory. In that lab for the last 10 years, we have been very actively engaged in development of theoretical understanding of transient luminous events in the Earth's atmosphere. So we work on a variety of subjects related to lightning and lightning behavior, lightning physics, and of course in the context of a global electric circuit modeling. We want to, to quantify how much lightning contributes to the global electric circuit, for example, in comparison with um, electrified thunderclouds and uh, electrified clouds. There is a significant controversy in existing uh, literature as to how much lightning contributes. So in some uh, cases, some uh, scientists actually claim 40% of the total current which is flowing in a global electric circuit is contributed by lightning. So we want to actually understand and quantify actual amounts.